like maybe what is or isn't going on. Oh, is this okay? Yeah, sure. Got it. you know, figuring what is or isn't going on in the mind of the creator of Shrimpy and Clammy necessarily in the unconscious there, but in the transcendent conditions for the creation of such an unconscious that would call you Princess Juliana. Don't you well, see? You know, she's actually probably more, well, I don't know if schizoid is the right term, than a lot of young children. You know, her her grandmother um, is is married to another woman, so her grandparents or lesbians, one of her aunts is also married to another woman. Um, so, you know, she's had a pretty, uh, I don't know, broad introduction to uh, non, what's the word? Non homo, I can't remember. Anyway. Non heteronormative. That's in the word. That's what I'm looking for. Non-heteronormative. She's had a fairly good exposure. Non-heteronormative uh, sexualities. I so that that lends itself nicely to talk about the flower imagery. And I'm not too sure where that imagery comes from. They mentioned the flower um, when talking about um, the male and the female and how you need four of them from Prowse. Um, okay, maybe you can explain that more in further detail. But I wonder, um, hypothetically, uh, Izzy, right? Um, yeah. She has two grandmothers instead of a grandmother, grandfather, right? And mm -hmm. so it seems to be outside the bounds of Freud and maybe Lacan's um, constructed, what do you even want to call it? Triangulation, if I'm using that correctly. So how would they respond to the, this existing thing and try and incorporate it in the system of edifice? Unless I'm just misfiguring it at all. And also the imagery of the flower and prouse, is that at all prevalent in this discussion? Are there people outside eating? They are, okay, thank you for letting me um, know. Could you help me find something? My little brother's changer, cause I can't find so, it. So you guys carry on. I'll be back at momentarily. <laughs> So you want me to help you find one? I'm not, I'm not an expert in psychoanalysis, action, but I think that the simple answer to your question is that I'm just kind of reading off of what I take to be typical, right? Um, they would just, you know, Freud or Freud or people following in his footsteps would just designate one of the two female as the stand-in for the father, right? In order to maintain the ethical structure which doesn't take, oftentimes, oftentimes doesn't take a big stretch of the imagination. Well, to, yeah. to, if, sorry, just a brief comment. Um, I, uh, I think that, yeah, maybe some like, like uh, Anna Freud or like Melanie Klein or those people that whom I have th certain disagreements with, they might interpret the writing and work of, you know, Freud and his analytic project in the sense that they would come to this point where they'd say, okay, yeah, there seems to just be this um, built in almost like physiognomatic destiny of the human brain that is built upon this foundation of the destiny of the family. And that family looks like this and we can get some real data about that. So like whether you, have you know whatever sort of parent or situation it's always gonna kind of follow the same pattern um and and you can and you can map that pattern on to the existing structures or personas in that life but i think that the other one other way i think that it's um kind of approached that would have a slightly different answer at least uh, maybe not, maybe in no way redeemed in the eyes of Guattari or Deluge, uh, but it was, uh, you know, but like, it was uh, Le Nom du Père, the, the seminar, the seminar by Lacan called Le Nom du Père, uh, the name of the father, and the, it's a, it sounds like Le Nom du Père, which is the no of the father, uh, but it's Le Nom, uh, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a play on words, and this Nom du Père, the name of the father, um is uh the effective 
um, signifier for this uh, figure that we're pointing to when we say the phrase, oh, well, one of them is the dad or who wears the pants in the family or, you know, <laughs> something like that. But it was Lacan who went far enough as to say this can be kind of confused with sort of physical reality or whatever, or empirical, like, like I literally have a, a desire to put my penis into my mother and, and kill my father. And if he finds out, he will wag his finger at me and say, no, 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 you may not perform a wedible incestuous sex with your mother or else I will cut your penis off. This is like, this is like bizarre Mad Max, like insanity this is never this this has occurred maybe once in a myth mythological text and even there a oedipus was not jazzed about it. i mean it's happened plenty of times plenty of people that have plenty of incest all the time don't worry but i'm saying in this case of even oedipus himself if there's anybody on earth who didn't have i think sigmund freud wrote in a letter if anybody on earth didn't have an oedipus complex it was oedipus because he was really bummed out you know about the fate of things but my point is Lacan said, okay, so it can get kind of confusing when we, when we try and stick this model onto this other kind of concurrent model of, of um, narcissistic empirical reality. And uh, he said, the name of the father is what uh, he would say uh, would be a better way to describe, not just the father, but the name of the father uh, would be a better way to convey this concept Given that, and he even went to, in, in this seminar, he was talking about it's it's easier to understand if your dad is dead. It's far easier to understand and relate to the concept of the name of the father if you have no father. If you have no father at all, then it's much easier to understand the concept of the name of the father because you're not getting lost and confused in this like, oh my, you mean my real dad? Oh, he's kind of a reasonable guy. What if I did have incestuous sex with my real mother? Shh, he would probably be like reasonable. He might talk it out. That's not very oedipal. This seems to break down the entirety of the psychoanalytic structure or whatever. And it would be like, whoa, 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 let's reel it in. You know, it's, it's not like, it's not a, it's not like a, I got some stupid book the other day called like symbols of dreams or something. And it was given to me, it was like a gift. It was got sim dream symbology. And it was like, here's 150 symbols you might see in your dreams and what they mean. And it's like, if you are flying in your dream, that means that your mind wants to look forward at your aspirations and, and what's coming next into your future. Has your, have your teeth ever fallen out in a dream? You're obviously afraid of aging or whatever. And it's like, okay, you're, oh my God. Like, it's not that consistent plug and play key. Like, let me look at the chart and see where's my dad and where's, what am I dreaming of? Oh, it's a, I'm dreaming of a dog or a vagina or, or uh, something, and I can, I, there's a definitive universal key code that I can use to, to decode my <laughs> dreams or my experience. Uh, but rather, I think, is it, so my, my, my point, I bring that up as like another example. It's like, that is the kind of analysis that I want to avoid and that I think, yeah, like an illegitimate disjunctive synthesis, this, this just bizarre like extrapolation and universalizing of seemingly kind of arbitrary or at least semi well-founded through some analytic experience. Like oh, 20 people were analyzed and they said that they both had dreams about teeth falling out and about aging, whatever, um, you know. And so that means that every time you think about your teeth falling out, it's because you're thinking about death and mortality and aging or whatever. This is not necessarily true. Maybe I have a cavity, uh, but my point is that is just another example of like, like Chase said in the chat, an illegitimate disjunctive synthesis. Um, and I think why, why it's easier to understand the name of the father without the physical father uh, is because you can understand that it is still present in your life, no matter what, even though dad is dead, the name of the father is still operative in some sense. Uh, in fact, in a, in a very important sense in the, in this kind of, uh, I, guess, I wanted to use, I wanted to steal a phrase from Deleuze and Guattari from the reading, a, uh, a network, a network of, of syntheses, laying out a network of syntheses uh, in experience uh, and not as just a like white American or Western Protestant family member with a, 
or, or you know, with a typical mother, father, mommy, daddy, me, literally kind of thing. But the, the a capacity for the title, the name of the father to refer to more than just the name of your dad, which my dad's name is Kevin, <laughs> you know, and that's not what they're talking about. And my dad is X, Y, and Z. And that's not what they're talking about. And my dad, blah, blah, blah. That's not who they, they don't give a fart about my dad. I mean, maybe if I was on their couch and I, I was paying them to, <laughs> to listen to me, they would care and they would talk about maybe, but, but there's a, a significant chance in most any uh, analysis, <laughs> I would imagine, that the, that the name of the father has very little to do with, their, with the guy who, whose sperm <laughs> was the you know, foundational constitutive element of their physical being you know, in this initial creative consummation. Uh, that the father for, for me or for whomever could be, I mean, again, it's, it, there's this urge to, to link it to a person, to a personal agent, to some sort of significant ego that has a definable unified structure that is uh, effectual in my reality and they have a will that they enact on me and that I have to resist with my will and we're already lost we're already we've completely lost the point at that point when we're focused on these agents of action and of abuse on me or whatever the establishment of an experience of law or something um, maybe this is an impossible question to answer since you don't you know know since you know nothing about my childhood but um, my parents split up when I was probably four and I barely remember his presence in my life you know when I was very young and he went to live we were living in Carlsbad New Mexico he lived in El Paso and we would visit him occasionally but he was largely absent uh, physically and I mean he didn't call or write or anything and so you know basically we, we would just see him every once in a while when we go visit and then he died when I was 12. And so I had no father, you know, effectively, I had no father presence in my life. And so what I'm wondering then, so what you say that nevertheless, the name of the father functions and would have functioned in my life. How? I mean, I, I'm wondering, you know, what, like what kinds of, you know, phenomena or experiences or relationships how would I have experienced that, you know, father figure or the name of the father in my life? I mean, I'm just, I mean, like I am one of those people, right? And so I'm just wondering how, how, you know, what were some of the ways that you would say, oh, well, that's where the, that was, that was the name of the father or that was the name of the father. I was going to say something, but I wanted to let Nathan go because he's raised his hand. I was just going to say the way that I read the way that I and I, I think I mean, like every everything Hunter was saying is is it reflects how I read Lacan as well. And in that in that reading of Lacan with the father thing is because the answer. Well, the question originally was about how is it um, how does it reflect that that triangle, that dynamic in like a, like a queer family? Right. So there is no actual biological or maybe there is but whatever that it doesn't have the mother and father sexed male, female, et cetera. Um, and and I think that it's sort of like looking at the Oedipal Triangle that I think maybe like Lacan is stretching out the, the, the concept of father with the name of the father, which and I said, is this this overlaps with. Um, with father as a censor which is what the symbolic order is as well. It's the cops, you know? Um, and so in that sense, it sort of over, overlaps with the superego uh, in Freud. But so it doesn't, you don't, the, like the physical father can be the way, the literal father um, can, it can be like a, a representation or a manifestation of that, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's, it's and, and, in, and in fact, as Hunter said, if your father is dead or not there, it can be more apparent to you. But I think that it's like some sort of aspect of, you know, of um, the signifying order that, you know, rather than rather than being something that happens in the nuclear family, 
like and not whether it's queer or not or non-existent it's there whether human like it doesn't need the family to happen it's something that happens through the family it has the potential to the agenda if it, if it, of the family if it's more apparent it seems like then i would be the kind of person where i would be say, be able to say oh i'm one of those people that had that didn't actually have a real a physical father and so it should be more apparent to me uh, what, that's what i'm asking where i mean i i get the church or, or a, a job or, or anything right like like the father acts on you through all of those all of those institutions from society right that's that's the father i think well and it happens it starts happening at early age no I want to. I agree. I, I agree with you, but I want to. I want to complicate the picture, maybe, because Nathan. I. I yes. I very much agree that like, it, it's it's here in these um, like uh, okay, the 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 father in the form of the church. That was a great like the church, the parent, the or the teacher, the whatever. That is definitely on like on the money. But I think that one thing that I'm remembering constantly when I'm thinking about Lacan is that he's always talking about this other as in the sense that it does not exist. Like, like, um, okay, how can I put this? Like, like the father, okay. The father in a sense is the guardian of the law. The father is the guardian of the law. But, and I remember I read this from Samuel Weber, not necessarily the legislator. The law is not necessarily given by anyone in particular, but there is the law. And the there of there is the law marks the place of the other. Uh, this this um, like place, if we can think of it as sort of a spatial place or topological place, it can be represented by the father. Um, and and this is, and Lacan calls the father the what is it in I have it here in French représentant originel, the original representative of the law. Uh, so the point is the the father, you know. What is, what is important is not the person of the father, but their role as the guardian of the law. Uh, and, and, and above all, in the place of like the dead father, the name can assume its structuring power, uh, which, and actually I know we, some people have talked about how this is a, not a favorite of theirs, but um, I've been looking into some passages from Totem and Taboo that uh, happens to deal a lot. I'm actually currently, I'm, I have some notes on it right here, uh, talking about parricide, uh, the death of the father, the killing of the father. Um, in this uh, relationship of the father condemning himself to death by wronging his son or whatever, in this illustration, in this illustration of concepts, only there does the father as a function become the effective side of the name of the father. Uh, and this, um, this inaccessibility is key, this inaccessibility of the name of the father uh, the other does not exist. It is always barred. It is always elsewhere. It is always inaccessible. And the name of the mode of the inaccessibility of the other is the name of the father. Uh, so it's the place from which des desire receives its law of prohibition, basically. Uh, and it's not necessarily enforced by that name of the father, but by the virtue of another signifier. Uh, and that signifier is the phallus, but that's a, you know, that's really complicated. Well, okay, so sorry, one, just like to try and go back to net, to be more direct and less just talking kind of about stuff and then just being vague. Um, where would you feel this um, presence, this, this presence, Nevit, given your life and history and experience and, um, uh, you know, this absence? I think that the pressure or the guilt, okay, okay, Nevit, you've talked to me about this before. Um, we have talked about, uh, our goals and our dreams and our duties and obligations and our whatever, you know, our lifestyles. I would argue, or I believe that a lot of my life is oriented around a feeling of obligation. And I do a lot of things based on obligations. Hi. Uh, and Nevit, you have said that, um, you prefer, or you don't really get the point of these obligations anymore. You've lived long enough that, hello that uh, you are more interested in, <laughs> in comfort, in, in relaxing, in not exactly challenging yourself constantly just for the sake of challenge and, and about 
about actually enjoying your life and avoiding pain, avoiding like pain, you know? We've talked about this and, and Nevin has put forward very legitimate arguments in favor of focusing on or in the, in the virtue of avoiding pain, that at least in certain circumstances, you know, of course. And I'm over here like, oh, you know, everything is suffering, blah, 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 whatever. Um, but Nevit, I, I also know that in the expression of, I think that it is a legitimate life path to avoid pain, there, that expressing, that enunciating is done in an effort. And that effort is one of justification or explanation, right? And that justification or explanation needs to be you, why are you justifying? Why are you explaining? Who are you justifying it to? Who are you explaining it to? And, and, and the, the thing I feel, or the thing that I could point to is, and I'm just, I'm using these terms um, non-professionally here, but something like a sense of um, like, oh, you know, people might not be keen on that. That might, I feel like kind of, you know, people, or I might feel guilty or strange or prohibited from saying these things. I feel like maybe people might resist what I'm saying because it might seem weird or off color or selfish or something. And I feel a need to justify or explain those things. Well, why do you need to feel, why do you feel a need to justify or explain? Because there's this sense of prohibition on your capacity to live a happy, fulfilling life away from pain. Some minimal quanta <laughs> of prohibition exists against your ends and aims and desires for satisfaction or fulfillment or happiness or whatever, you know, uh, and that motivation, that thing that motivates you to, you know, read Nietzsche and find meaning about it in your own life and to live a good life and whatever, these, these compulsions that you feel, these things compelling you around you to, to try and do the right thing, you know what I mean? Like, or, or, to, or to at least live a decent, respectable life or, or something. So be positive rather than negative. Uh, not commit genocide all the time or commit hedonistic acts of assault and battery and violence and, uh, you know what I mean? Like to not be a genocidal maniac or, or a complete sociopath um, or just let yourself go and not care about it. even your kids, you know, why, why did you not hold your child in your hands, you know, and say, well, this is kind of a, I do love them and they make me feel kind of warm, but they're kind of a financial burden on me and you blow them against the ground, you know, and just say, okay, splatter, they're done. There's, there's certain compelling features of not only the fact that it's illegal and frowned upon that would incentivize you not to do that. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm referencing a child relationship now to bring us back into this sort of talking about a Oedipus thing. But there is a whole host of mechanisms of prohibition that, that uh, motivate a prohibition that sustains a desire. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the movement of that prohibition, that's the name of the father. But I, it seems, if I, and I'm not sure I'm, I'm representing the losing guitar guitar property here but to me it seems that that proves too much i mean it's like you know you can like part of what they seem to be saying is using that kind of framework you can read like i said in the comment you can reduce all human power relations to this one convenient cookie cutter psychoanalytic framework you know and and it it to me it, again it seems to me it proves too much it's, it's like it's you know, you can you can reduce anything, virtually anything, into that framework, and it kind of works. And it, um, you know, and so that if at least to me, it seems that's part of what what uh, they're complaining about is that um, you know is that it's, it it is that psychoanalysis at least the way whatever. And I don't know how much of that's Freud, how much of that's Lacan, but it just reduces like everything to this, you know, to this Oedipal uh, framework. I've heard that, I've heard that too. Uh, I mean, I, you know, you got, I mean, Chase read the whole book, uh, so maybe it gets into that more, but I've heard people make that, you know, I've heard that 
about um, like saying that the Oedip Oedip it's like the Oedipus complex is just grafted on whatever you want. Like it's doing a reading of something through a certain lens. Um, but I mean, at least from the reading for today, it seems like the issue is not necessarily that, although it could be, it's that it's, it's, it's the fact that psychoanalysis uses the Oedipus complex as sort of a blueprint for how to like um, prescribe the patient uh, to sort of like fall in line with, you know, like bourgeois normative uh, behavioral patterns and, and things like that. Like they, they, that it's, the emphasis is that it's used as a, the, the Oedipus, Oedipus complex is used as the Oedipal father, you know, like it's being used that way by, by psychoanalysts. Is that right? That's how I read that section, the whichever one we're on three and, or three and four. Yeah. Of chapter two, um, yeah. so it's sort of like they. I, 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 as far as I can tell, at least right now, I don't think that they entirely reject the Oedipus complex. Um, when I, I mean, you know, from my own reading of, uh, you know, other post-structuralist things and psychoanalytic things, that would be a kind of foolish to dismiss it entirely, right? Yeah, they're definitely not dismissing it as a as something that isn't real. Uh, I think it's more, it's much more uh, subtle and complex kind of what they're arguing in the sense that, so it is a real thing, the Oedipus complex, um, although, and psychoanalysis did not invent it through its application. Although they're arguing that a lot of psychoanalysis in its practice has uh, sort of strengthened it or recapitulated it in certain ways and also has obscured kind of its basis of how it formed and have kind of just uh, muddled a lot of the territory greatly. Um, so I think, yeah, the, kind of the question is, um, you know, uh, the Oedipus complex, is it necessarily saying that we need to, by pointing this out, I mean, it's kind of like this, you know, this uh, classic question of, by pointing out something about a power structure, are you giving a description of it, or is it a prescription, or is it somewhere in between, or neither, or what is going on with that? Um, I think the question there, so for Freud, it seems like he was saying that, you know, this Oedipus complex is a part of the, the moral structure and the order of society that if it's not uh, kind of adhered to, then it, it will cause mass destruction and we'll get things like uh, like world wars and whatnot. And so there's this kind of idea of, you know, there's um, this chaotic element that needs to be somewhat controlled by something, this the super ego, whatever it is. And I, so there's that aspect of it um, that I think is what, they want to point out as something that psychoanalysis has somewhat done, but then there's also the element, um, not just that it simply kind of points out um, a societal structure and says, okay, well, maybe we need this. Um, but there's also these elements in which, I think it's, well, one thing is that it's obscuring kind of uh, what actually brings it about this kind of, this uh the social repression aspect of it and do we actually need that um well okay okay here let's i'm gonna go back to um jackson uh one of the first questions um so you were asking okay first about the uh the marriages that are not heteronormative. Okay, so I think one of the, the interesting things that 
is going on with uh, here with the whole sexuality gender thing is so there's a Oedipal homosexuality and there's an uh, an an Oedipal homosexuality. So there's kind of two different orders um, of homosexuality and hetero, which corresponds to the heterosexuality. So it's still using the same kind of binary structure or it's kind of a binary uh, exclusive exclusion kind of structure mixed with that triangular Oedipal structure. So in the, that sounds like a bunch of word salad, but anyways, okay. So the illegitimate thing that psychoanalysis does um, would be to say, okay, yes, there's only uh, male and female. And, but of course you can have these kind of, there's different factors in which it, it takes place. So you have one thing would be something like your sex, your your male or female. Um, I mean, it, I'm not claiming this, is that's not true, but, but anyways, uh, so, and then you have an identification. So we'd call that today, just like a gender identification. And they're saying, so it's psychoanalysis by this description is saying, uh, that's either male or female too. So you already have kind of two different factors right there, but then also you have an object choice and that is either male or female. And so there's a lot of different combinations you can come up with, but it's still based off the same kind of logic of exclusive disjunction of either or. And that's what, um, so you can have a lot of different combinations with that, but still there's gonna be some kind of a, a way of fitting that into an Oedipal structure. But then there's this other aspect, the an Oedipal homosexuality, which they're gonna to relate to. So th that one, I'm not totally sure exactly what they mean by it. So um, or one thing it said in here is that by was it statistically we are in, in a, a molar sense we are heterosexual in a personal sense we are homosexual and in a molecular sense we are transsexual i don't quite get the personal homosexual aspect unless it has something to do with i don't know maybe like narcissism or something like that um but the molecular transsexual aspect I think makes sense and I think that's what they're really getting at in terms of that there's an an Oedipal sexuality that doesn't cater to a binary distinction between male and female as an exclusive and I think that's also what they're getting at with the uh the Proust text so okay which is quite confusing but so I read something, it was, uh, see, it just looks like a black book. Yeah, I guess what, I'm holding up books to the camera again, which I think one of the first, this, okay, this, I've hardly done this at all, this, this seminar. So I'm just saying, y'all should be proud for me. Okay, but anyways, this book is The Works of Gilles Deleuze, Volume 1. Uh, so it's just a, it's a description of, some of his early works, and it's a really good description of everything up to logic of sense. But I read this 20 page description of his book on Proust, of Deleuze's book on Proust. And well, first of all, I'm kind of pissed off because now I have to read it. But uh, I think it, so it has some good points in there that I think I was able to make some sense about what they're talking about. But as far as what they're saying, just in the passage in Anti-Oedipus in this reading, so the there's, on one side, there's these exclusive series of these different genders. And some of them, they 
can only interact in certain ways or they can't interact. Um, and I think this has to do with, this is the, um, these kind of uh, connective syntheses, but they're structured by repression, social repression, which they haven't really talked that much about yet. We'll get into that at, towards the end of this chapter. But uh, so they talk about, okay, why do we suddenly have these, uh, you know, a global object instead of partial object? Well, it's because there's limitations uh, placed on what the object choice is. And so there's kind of things that disrupt design production. And that's what causes uh, these exclusions to start coming about. It's through social mechanisms, basically, that structure then these exclusive series where you then have something like, oh, there's just a group of girls and that becomes the object choice for the narrator and Proust novel. Or you have something, um, okay, no, we can only have, you know, this kind of one binary kind of interacting with another binary. Uh, I don't know, some of it was really confusing actually, because there's, it just sounded like he was describing all the different combinations you can do. But then the other side that he said corresponded with that was the flower thing, <laughs> uh, which has to do with innocence which I, I thought of Hunter when I was reading that. Was a, I know Hunter likes innocence. Um, and so that has to do with this aspect of, it doesn't, any point can connect with any other point. The rhizome, one point can connect with another point. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's no exclusion going on here. In the same way, the orchid and the flower there, it's not, you know, male, female, or or homosexuality, or any bisexual. Just none of that. It's it's uh, outside of that structure, that exclusive structure of some kind of sexual orientation or identification or whatever. It's just simply desiring connections being made right there, and I think that's what they're trying to kind of say, okay, this is the other aspect that's in Proust's novel. And you've kind of got these playing off against each other throughout. Um, and also the, so the innocence thing, I think this also has to, as a, a Nietzschean reference with the, the innocence of becoming too, um, but that's a little beside the point. Um, what was the other thing? that, oh, I guess that was a Proust novel. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. So I, I'm not sure if this is a good case, but, or a good example, but, <clears throat> and I'm actually not sure I understand the people involved enough to say for sure, but when my, you know, my sister-in-law is married to a woman and the, and the woman that she's married to, at least to me, does not clearly present as male or female. And sometimes she presents more one, sometimes more the other. It kind of depends on what she's doing, you know, what, what activity she's engaged in, what people she's talking to, whether she's talking to children, or to her wife, and she seems to, at least to me, it seems, and again, if I talk to her, you know, maybe my outside perception is, is wrong, but that she's not terribly worried about, you know, what, about what her sexual identity is, um, and I don't mean that in a, I don't know, I, Anyway, what I mean is, it, 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 I'm, I don't know if this is the case, but it sounds a bit like what maybe Deleuze and Guitar are talking about in that she has this, you know, this sort of disjunctive um, 
I don't know even if you want to call it an identity, but this disjunctive sense of who, who she is. And she, you know, she kind of shifts and moves pretty easily between these different domains um, very comfortably, you know, and, and she's not, you know, and it seems like one elite, and I don't, again, I don't know Freud, I don't know Lacan well enough to know how, you know, how well, how much of a place they have for that kind of phenomena, but it seems clearly that Deleuze and Guattari want to, want to say that that's, um, you know, that that in some way that's more the way we are, and then we impose these kind of artificial roles based on you know, because like he does seem to think that, that the edible car, Oed, Oedipus does import, you know, as, as uh, Eric was saying, certain bourgeois uh, familial structures and, and, and it, it pretends like there's some sort of transcendental norm that we have some obligation to conform to. I don't think, I will say, I don't think that um, at least in my reading of of uh, uh, Lacan, he he doesn't think there's anything transcendent about it at all. Um, I mean, Freud may have, you know, to the degree that he was, you know, of his time or whatever. But um, I don't know. I, I just uh, I I can't. I I don't I don't see that in Lacan. I don't think that they think that about him. But I do think that they're talking shit to him. So I don't know. Other people are are more suited to, or more qualified to talk about that than me. But I, Lacan wouldn't say that it was transcendent though. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, so that was something that was, I guess kind of bothering me too, to a certain degree in that, um, so what they're saying is transcendent for, I mean, for the Oedipus complex, in general, but for Lacan specifically would be this idea of, so this is the, the illegitimate use of the synthesis that takes a partial object that's detached in some way and then extrapolates that to be some kind of a universal. And they think that, it, so that's what the the phallus is, or this idea of a missing signifier. Um, and I think they're saying that it's transcendent in the fact that, well, I mean, if you think about the word transcendent in a most kind of literal way, it's just something that you know climbs beyond what is going on here. So the fact that it's always has to do with this lack. And it can never be given in any kind of in I think not even just in a kind of straightforward empirical way, but in any way that it's kind of just a, a it just simply signifies something that's not there, but that that itself structures everything, uh, I guess. I think that's what they would say is the transcendent element of it. Um, I'm not sure exactly how, if, if that works or, I mean, this is, I think this is part of it where my, I have a, just an elementary, very basic knowledge of Lacan. So uh, I'm not sure if that's right at all, but, uh, it seems to be kind of what they're saying. At least the, I think they're saying they're using that synthesis illegitimately. And that is what, that's the specific element, the, the phallus and the way that it's also to do with a, a negative lack kind of structure, that that's what's transcendent about it. Um, I don't know, I may be wrong about that. Oh, so Nevit, what, what you were talking about earlier, though, um, in terms of 
you know, some kind of a non-binary gender thing. Uh, I think that is kind of the direction that uh, those and Guattari are, are going. Although it's somewhat, it's somewhat complicated um, in the sense that, okay, so I've, I've posted about this in the, in the Discord is they have a, a, they deal with this pretty specifically later in the book, although they talk about it somewhat in this section we just read. Um, but they have this idea, okay, so there's molar and molecular. So molar is just kind of more or less complete integrated objects, just in a common sense kind of way macroscopic kind of visual field contours. These are aggregates that have some kind of relative stability to them. That's what they're gonna refer to as the molar. Molar aggregates are, and they think that there's a kind of statistical logic that underlies a lot of what goes on with the molar in terms of how it expresses itself in one way or another but that it's always kind of, it's still these molar uh, aggregates are still shifting according to the molecular, which is just kind of, that's what constitutes the molar. So the molecular, that has to do with these flows and this kind of, I mean, if you think about kind of, I'm not sure if this, don't take my word on this, but almost kind of a literally molecular, molecules that the way that these flow and are exchanged and whatnot um sort of underneath but also kind of constitutive within all of our molar aggregates that that's something that they're going to highlight as well this is really where desiring production goes on and also this is really kind of the um, where to find the the essence of libido in the sense that this is still sexuality but it's not a sexuality that is going to correspond with any kind of identity in the sense that I can say I'm this or that um, it's always going to be something that is a singularity and is going to be distinct for itself um, so then there's a question of, okay, so if people are exhibiting something like this on the level of kind of molar identification somewhat, um, is that going to just, where does that leave us? Does it, does that mean we just, there's just an analogy between what they're saying? I think, well, I think no is I think there's still ways in which these molecular aspects can kind of erupt into uh, kind of the macroscopic molar level in terms of uh, these intensities that kind of come about. And I think they'll get into this in the next section when they talk about the conjunctive synthesis, because that has to do with this idea of the nomadic subject and whatnot that can identify with everything. And so I think you kind of see that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of, um, so these aspects that I think are more kind of pressing today than, you know, in 1972, questions about this, um, I think, it shows that they were, they had some kind of uh, perception of somewhat like these trends that were occurring. And if you look at it in the sense of, uh, you know, it's this kind of cultural schizophrenia where you had this greater sort of acceleration of different identifications that kind of come about, uh, all these different, so we see these kind of fixed structures of, you know, even the nuclear family sort of uh, 
deteriorating in one sense into a kind of all these, you know, I mean, it's basically the internet. It's, if you look at TikTok or whatever, there's so many different levels of identification and it just, whether it's really bypassing the structure of, or if it's just simply kind of recapitulating, you know, weak ego identifications on a, on a kind of consumerist level um, in order to get you to buy something you identify with. I don't know. There's some kind of ambiguity there, but I think it's definitely very interesting to kind of connect those, this idea they have of, well, it's not really about binary, either or, male, female. Instead, there's this molecular component that has to do with, so they say, uh, in sexes. So in is just the, the variable for, a. okay, I don't wanna to get too much into this because it's, it's very technical. I don't even really understand it that well, but they had this idea of in sexes where, so in has to do with this idea of dimensions in a manifold. So they get this from uh, Riemann. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but he had ideas about um, topology and multiplicities in mathematics. And the idea is simply, well, that you can have some kind of a number and there's simply dimensions that correspond to that. Um, but that's opposed to uh, a kind of Cartesian idea where you would have kind of the components of a system, but you have coordinates outside of those that then give you some kind of a, a fixed location there. Instead for uh, a Riemann multiplicity manifold kind of thing, you only have the dimensions that are kind of uh, imminent to what is being modeled, which I probably lost everyone by now, but the idea is that you can have any number of these dimensions of a manifold and they see it as, okay, this is the same thing that's going on with molecular flows that you can have uh, in number, any number of these possible identifications, but they all kind of constitute their own distinct intensity. Um, and that's uh, that's basically their idea of sexuality. Um, it's trying to make sense of that, especially in terms of what we see on a, a molar level that I think is difficult, but um, maybe we'll get there. I don't know. I feel like I, I probably lost a lot of people there, but uh, whatever, getting schizo, I guess. All righty, Nevitt's back with us. And speaking after Chase is always hard. And I really did like the beginning, Chase. I really did. And that's why I asked my question about the either or or because you talked about the disjunctive there. And I liked when you brought up TikTok and the relevance of DNG today. All right. So it all just wasn't uh, whatever you want to say. Can we talk about the spider analogy or not? Maybe it's not an analogy, but I just thought that was cool. The imagery of the spider, um, if you guys remember what, that. What page the, is that on? It was in the connective synthesis of production. I think it was rather early on. Um, I can go hunt for that if somebody else has a question. But I had an issue with that image because they described the, the, the spider not observing anything. Mm -hmm. And yet they go on to say like, you know, the moment something lands in the web, the spider is attuned, it knows what to do. Like, well, that's because it was observing what you said it wasn't doing. Oh, I, I thought the idea was like, the spider's looking away for some reason. It is a dumb analogy, because now I have to dig holes for D and G. 
But um, I guess the spider was looking away and then it feels the vibration. It's like, aha, I know what to do now. And I was not observing it before. Vibration is a form of observing. Okay. Then, yeah. So, okay, so I think uh, at least what this reminds me of is the descriptions of um, ethology that are given kind of throughout. Okay, so Deleuze's favorite animal was, didn't like dogs, didn't like cats. Uh, his favorite animal was a tick. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Um, Okay, so the way he describes the tick, what he, he thinks is interesting about it is that, uh, well, it's kind of this Heideggerian thing in the sense that, actually, I'm not, I'm not even gonna go into that, Never mind, just totally scratch that. Um, okay, so his analysis of the tick is that you have certain, what really kind of constitutes this animal isn't, its species is in its uh, its genus is in its in this no um, so what really determines a body what a body can do is its affects and its capacities it's so its power is a is a capacity to to affect or be affected so the way that a body is affected constitutes more what it can do and what it is than some kind of taxonomical kind of classification. So he says that a tick is interesting because it just has these three um, inputs, I guess, that really activate it and correspond with what it can do. So what it can do is it can, uh, it can sense moisture, um, slight, like heat and something, some kind of scent that is like, oh, there's a animal, animal blood is near. And they can kind of stay in suspended animation until they're, activated by some of these things. And the way that their affects are clearly, and also their territory uh, is kind of correlated with each other, but and activated by each other and by this, you know, so that suddenly when you have an animal that comes into their environment, they can be activated in this way. That's, uh, that's kind of significant to um, well, this aspect that Deleuze thinks is uh, in terms of what a body can do, which is that's kind of the body that organs uh, and this focus on affects and power rather than um, some kind of, yeah, identity structure. I think that's what he's getting at for the most part, although, so I, I vaguely remember the spider thing. I don't remember the context that that was in. So I, I'm not sure exactly how to relate those, but I think that's kind of what he means by saying that, okay, yeah, there's, it's not observing on one level and then all of a sudden vibration, it's activated. That's sort of its, that's its environment is these powers of its body to, to kind of connect with other things in that way. Um, so yeah, that's my attempt at it. <laughs> A good attempt. I like hearing about the tick. You know, it's one of those fun facts you can talk about. You know, Deleuze like the tick. Um, the spider section I found. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah, bottom of 68. I can read it. Um, I thought it was a bigger part than it is, but it is just one sentence. But yeah, I think it is interesting. Um, it is clear that the narrator of the book uh, In Search of Lost Time uh, sees nothing, hears nothing, and that he is a body without organs, or like a spider posed in its web, 
observing nothing but responding to the slightest sign, to the slightest vibration by springing on its prey. Everything begins with nebulae, statistical holes whose outlines are blurred, molar, or collective formations comprising singularities distributed haphazardly. There we are. Yeah. Oh, God. So I think I've already, already talked so much, uh, but I, I can explain this, but I think, so Nathan. Yeah, I had a, well, I had a, I, I remember it now that you read it too. And I remember thinking when I read it, that's a very bizarre reading of Proust. Like that, that book is nothing but observation. That's all it is. So it's almost like, I don't know, it's their, it just seems like it's, it just seems like to just be intent, try, trying to be provocative or, or, and then not really following through after, after, you know, saying something provocative about Proust, just be like, well, actually this book that you think is, you know, a work of, uh, you know, none, none more psychologically observant than Proust, right? So now let's say that that's not what he did at all. And then, but then they don't kind of follow through with that. So I don't know, maybe they do later in the book. I know Deleuze is a big fan of Proust, yeah? So, but I don't know. I didn't, I couldn't make heads or tails of that. I was just like, oh, that's weird. That's not how I read that book, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so his reading of Proust is... Um... So the book is called Proust and Signs, and the idea is that there's a, he calls it an apprenticeship that's going on with the narrator, and that it's about um, these certain kind of uh, levels of signs that the narrator picks out and has to interpret and decipher in order to gain some kind of higher uh, truth towards well, essence, but uh, it's all very kind of platonic in a weird way. Um, but the idea is that he's picking up on signs, but there's only certain signs that kind of, and but how do these signs come about? You have to kind of encounter them in a, in a violent aspect. So, he stresses the, the, the aspect that it's not this kind of voluntary um, sort of thing, but instead the narrator or whoever is sort of picked out according to these signs. So one of them is obviously the, so is the, the famous scene of where he eats the little cake, the Madeline, and is suddenly kind of involuntarily transported into this memory of his childhood in this city. Uh, but it's not a it's not an actual experience he's ever had before. Instead, it's almost kind of like the essence of the city in his childhood kind of comes to him. But how does it relate to this, you know, uh, the taste of this cake? that requires, you know, further interpretation. And the same way, so there's uh, the signs of love or the, the, from the lover. Okay, so this is something like you get, actually, so the example they have here, I think is helpful to kind of illustrate. Um, so everything begins with nebulae, statistical holes, whose outlines are blurred, molar, or collective formations comprising singularities distributed haphazardly. A living room, a group of girls, a landscape. So the first level of signs has to do with, oh, what are those? I think something like um, social signs. I don't know. You got some kind of collective social signs that have to do with high society and these kind of vapid rules of uh, uh, social rules to a certain degree, it seems like. Um, but this has to do with this kind of collective level that at first Proust kind of engages with and this um, trying to kind of gain some kind of meaning in his life through entering high society. And he he has to kind of interpret these signs that are emitted from these interactions that he, he does observe 
Um, but it, the thing is that these, the signs that come to him are something that he's not kind of, as a kind of peer observer pointing out or looking at, it's more kind of the signs are, are what is the agent here in terms of uh, kind of forcefully taking him and saying, you have to interpret this rather than that there's some kind of conscious subject that's the agent that's looking at it and observing it. I think that's kind of what he's getting at. So, but one thing, okay, so the, these high society rules have to do with these collectives, but then these different signs kind of point to actual people within these collectives. So then he talks about the signs of love as being what selects people out from groups. So at first you have, what is the, okay, a singularity, you can see it as, it's what is distinct about this system or this formation. So what is distinct about it um, at first is kind of, it's vague and it has to do with just kind of a group. So at first you just have this group of girls that the narrator is obsessed with, but then slowly you get these signs that start to kind of uh, select and differentiate certain people out of the group and that's where he goes from, okay, there's a group of girls to suddenly there's this one girl, uh, Albertine, or however you pronounce that in French. Uh, and that becomes kind of uh, one of the lovers of the narrator. And then you still have signs then, okay, that, that smile, what did that mean? That comment, what did that mean? So you still have signs then from this other level that shows that there's still some kind of uh, molecular multiplicity going on that signs kind of indicate, but can never really kind of collapse into, you know, some kind of fixed meaning there. Um, and I think the thing is that the, where the motion is, is more in the signs and this kind of involuntary uh, structure of, so one of the big things in difference repetition is this idea of, okay, what is thought, real thought is, it's not something that's voluntary. It has to be something that is involuntary, that there's kind of this violence of sensation that shocks our faculties beyond any kind of resemblance or identification. And that, asymmetry between the sensation and the shock of sensation. That's what stimulates us to think. And that's also done through these sign signals. And that's also how he's kind of reading Proust. And, but he shows a kind of progression that goes along with these different regimes of signs, uh, leading all the way to art signs, which that's where the singularity of these various signs kind of come to a, I don't know, some kind of a, a peak of some type. I don't know. I haven't read the book, the Proust book at all. Actually, I've, I've read like the first five pages. It seems pretty cool. Um, but looking at it, it looked pretty daunting. So oh, where is it? Yeah, I had the first volume, or actually I think it's the first two volumes kind of in one book but it's 900 pages yeah it's it's easier to read than anti Oedipus. <laughs> oh yeah i would yeah i would hope so <laughs> but yeah anyways that that's kind of his reading of proust and hopefully that makes some more sense uh probably not but i think it does have to deal with you know never you were asking about singularities Oh, you've got another question here. But I think, okay, the singularity in this case, what he mentions here as, you know, the nebulous group of girls or molar kind of collectives, it would be, that is what is distinctive here, but it's it's also, it's not just a, kind of a, a thing 
in the normal sense. Instead, it's, a, it's about a distribution. Um, so it's a distribution that is distinctive, and that's what he's going to think of as singularities. So, but then it, there's kind of a progression that goes along with it, and I think he's showing that uh, to say that okay, you've got these molar components, but then they lead towards these restricted um, persons. Because I think that's the thing is, um, okay, you've got these collective molar groups, but then you have selections from there of persons, which that's gonna be the illegitimate use of the connective synthesis is to go from partial objects to global persons. But then, I think the idea is, okay, once design production really kind of kicks in and, okay, narrator and Albertine, you know, I'm referring to them as global persons and therefore using the, the synthesis in, in an illegitimate fashion. But anyways, whatever, let's say we, we start getting our design production, you know, kicking. And uh, then all of a sudden, her face becomes a multiplicity and it's like you're tripping and just like, oh, her eyes are all over here and her face is all over here. I don't know, I haven't read the book, but um, then all of a sudden you've got these partial objects back again. So I think that's a way of kind of showing that, yeah, there's a movement between these like illegitimate forms of the syntheses that are connected with a kind of restriction which have to do with global persons and molar collectives. And then you've also got these kind of fragmented desiring production that this also, and there's, they kind of oscillate back and forth in all these different ways. So, yeah. I um, was looking up the definition of mole and you know, molecule in chemistry. I, I don't know if they're trying to draw on, on that similarity or not. But, you know, in chemistry, a mole is just a, a number of something. Like if you have a mole of atoms or a mole of molecules, it's, uh, it, it's Avogadro's number, which is, you know, a giant number starting with a six. And so if you have a mole of something, you just have a certain number of something. It's like a, you have a dozen eggs, well, you have a mole of something. And then a molecule is not you know, a molecule is something that has, I don't know what, you know, how you would define it. I mean, the way they define it is yeah. just you know, something, but, but I guess the notion of mole, I'm wondering if they're drawing a little bit on that when they talk about moles and connections with singularities, because, you know, moles don't have, I mean, there's no characteristic there that defines what it is, you know, so a molar, a mole of something is just a number. A molar mass is just the mass of some number of something. And so a mole doesn't, doesn't really have a lot of distinguishing characteristics. So I'm wondering if it's just an, if he's associating, if they're associating that with the notion of singularity, whereas a molecule has uh, more, you know, a, a, has, is a, has a characteristic of a substance that interacts with things in certain ways. So it actually has a, you know, a, a it's more, more uh, capable of entering into relationships with things rather than just being a collection of objects. So I, I don't know if they're trying to draw on something like that, but that's. So I think the molar that they refer to, so this is actually one of the weird things where I actually kind of remember chemistry from back in high school and remember enough to know that this is definitely they're definitely not talking about the the strict kind of chemical concept um in which case i would probably be cautious about just um thinking about it too much in those terms because that could be confusing uh, I think it's it's actually more simple than that. It's kind of just uh, the molar is these large aggregates. And that's also this kind of macroscopic level. Um, this kind of whole complete things in a way, um, although they can also be uh, 
groups. They can also be distributions of certain things. But, and also uh, they do have singularities. So in a way, almost everything I would, I think has a singularity um, in the sense that it has some kind of a distinguishing feature to it. And that, so they, they say that in uh, this line here about the, everything begins with nebulae, statistical holes, whose outlines are blurred, molar or collective formations comprising singularities distributed haphazardly. So I think that's, you know, it's kind of um, about your level of magnification that they're getting at. So from this level of magnification kind of zoomed out, they're saying that that's what the singularity is, is on this kind of molar collective formation level. It's blurred, but, and from there, you get uh, sides start to take shape, series, persons, figure in these series under strange laws of lack, absence, asymmetry, exclusion, non-communication, vice, and guilt. So I think this is the whole, this is the, the side of it that has to do with social repression or desire under social repression that then because there's this kind of limitation to it, um, lack has been kind of added to it. Therefore, it has it has to go along with persons instead of just this kind of free form desire where any point can connect with any other point. Um, so I think one of just the way I think of that is, is it, it seems kind of silly that think that, you know, what the hell is, are even these partial objects then at this point? Because the way that I understand desire is I, I desire people or things or objects or something. Um, but I think if you think about it, what they're getting at here is something like, okay, I made the, the experience of an infant is one of just kind of not really paying attention to some kind of idea that there's global persons behind the kind of connections they wanna make. If they're hungry, they they want milk. Uh, so they've got partial objects to kind of make those connections. They're not interested in some kind of where's, who is the, the global person that this partial object is connected to? But uh, fast forward, when you're much older, um, so if I want my milk, my, uh, corresponding uh, object of desire. I can't just uh, be like, oh, I don't, I don't know who the global object uh, is connected with this will be. I just know I, I want this thing. Instead, I kind of have to plan it out and do it under the rules of, of prohibition of these various social rules in order to actually attain this object of desire. So I, I'll probably have to do something like get married or something like that and think about, okay, this person, this person seems like they actually have this object that I desire. And that's, I think, where they're saying, okay, now this is where you can see that there has to be some kind of an exclusion already going on. Um, that kind of limits this free form kind of any point can connect with any other point. And that is what makes people focus on, oh, desire is in global persons. So I have to focus on that. Um, yeah, at least that's the way I made sense of that. What was the original question? I don't even know 
it was Nevit who asked, right? I don't even, I can't remember well, we anything. Start, we started with the spider analogy at the bottom of 68, and then that on the top of 69 moved into the molar molecular stuff and the singularities. Yeah. Well, guys, I did have another point to talk about, but Hunter, you want? Yeah, yeah, I would. I could. Yeah, if you're just like kind of like pulling a rabbit out of your magic hat of uh, topics, I actually do. I have some, I have some questions. Uh, okay, I'll give it to you, but you owe me one. Okay. Oh yeah, I appreciate this favor that you're doing for me. Yeah, of I, course. Uh, okay. I'm. Uh, I am prohibited from doing, from just naturally speaking freely uh, by Jackson. And it's the very fact that he's prohibiting me like this that makes me want to cut a deal, makes me want to negotiate with reality. You know what I mean? Enter into the interplay and uh, sustains my desire. Never mind. Um, I see now that's the, see that kind of thinking, that's sort of a wet you know conservative thinking that I am doing, you know, this psychoanalytic thinking. Yes, it does, by the way, for the, the obvious question that Nevit put forward. That does mean he's that. But I just to try and break free of this, I have I'm trying to really um okay. I have a question about because I have I I have three there are a couple points. We talked about the molar molecular thing. That was one of the first things I, I had a question about, but there are three other things that I, I was confused about in this reading, but I don't want to really have to cover all three of them uh, because I think they can all be kind of approached at once. Uh, hopefully uh, I'm still confused. Well, no, I'm still unsure of the nature of non signifying signs, like the ones that are brought. Cause we were talking, this was something that Nevit just said in the chat. And, and when we were like, oh, what was the original question? I looked into the chat and I saw, oh, that was that was a question. Was what, have we gotten any closer to figuring out what they mean when they say there's non-signifying signs? And I remember, Chase, you talked something about um, when you read uh, Thousand Plateaus and they kept saying a signifying where this and that, you know, and it just happens over and over, but it doesn't seem to stick. You know, it doesn't seem to signify anything. All right, it's like, oh, God. <laughs> sorry. Um, moving on. Uh, I I just wanted to know: Are we? Is there? Are we any closer to figuring out this? The notion or the nature of these non-signifying signs? Because, I, and I have a follow-up question that I think are kind of tied in. Uh, because they specify polyvocal writing and detachable fragments they say polyvocal writing and detachable fragments as two examples of non-signifying signs this is on page 73 this is on page 73 in the first paragraph they're talking about this common transcendent absent something called the phallus or law uh blah 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 uh, what epis has its formula three plus one the one of the phallus it is as if the so-called signifying chain made up of elements that are some that are themselves non-signifying of polyvocal writing and detachable fragments for the object of a special treatment. So I guess, is that just to say, I, and that kind of makes it clear almost, or makes it clearer, and I want to kind of ask a clarifying question then. These poly, this polyvocal writing and detachable fragments which the signifying chain is made up of, the elements of the signifying chain that are themselves non-signifying, does that just mean like, like, um, okay, I'll give you an example. This is a reference to um, pictographic writing. Okay, I'll give you an example that makes the way that I think of this to make it make sense to me in pictographic writing is how I do it. Because I, I took Japanese for a, a long time in uh, my undergrad. And in order to learn Japanese, there are multiple character systems. One of them is hiragana, which is just basically um, phonemes represented by a symbol, you know. A i u e o kaki kukeko mami mumemo nani nu yeah okay, but then there's a not there I mean then there's katakana and whatever but there's a th another class of writing that is a a carryover a holdover from the Chinese root of the Japanese etymology like like the the history of Japanese the uh, language is kind of embedded in this 
history of being well Chinese colonizers who moved over to the island and, and colonized the Ainu indigenous people. So there was a lot of Chinese language being spoken on the island for a long time. And it only morphed slowly into what we know as Japanese. So kanji, the Japanese writing system kanji is just Chinese characters. And they sound way different now. They're pronounced completely differently. They read way differently. They might even have different meanings, but the symbols are the same. And so if you can read Mandarin, you can recognize the symbols very immediately and have a rough guess as to what the Japanese is trying to say. So my point is kanji is interesting because there are parts of kanji called, they're either called particles or they're called, I think they're, they're not called particles, I think they're called radicals uh, for some reason, but they're these, small marks it's like the it's like the it's like basically to, to denote pen marks or brush strokes really brush strokes in calligraphy which is like like a little dash a li like like a, and i'll put it in the chat even right now like maybe an apostrophe by itself you know and a and a dash and like a, you know i don't know sure these symbols that by themselves separated they don't really mean a whole lot but you put them together and you get a character. You get a character made up of a series of small uh, brushstroke shapes that form a picture, which denotes a term, right? And so these parts of this picture by themselves have mean nothing. I mean, you can maybe, sometimes you can see a pattern like, oh, this, there's a radical here that mixes with this. And then, oh, okay, I, I don't know what the, I, I asked my host family this uh, when I was over there in study abroad. What would you do if you see a kanji and you can't read it? Because you can't read it and you don't know what it's, you can't sound it out. How do you read it? That's such a mystery to me. And then they said, my host dad said, you know, I never really thought about it. <laughs> and he said, you know what I would do? I have a solution. I would ask the oldest person I see. Whoever's the oldest, they probably know the most. They probably have the highest knowledge of the full kanji. And I would just ask them, hey, old guy, What's this say? Do you know this? Do you recognize this? And if not, it would bother me for the rest of the day. I might draw it and then try and look it up later, you know? <laughs> and I was like, that's funny and an interesting problem to have with a pictographic language. But the point is, he, he could like, you could sometimes say, oh, I think it has something to do with like a field, like a, or a or rain, because it has a similar particle to the rain kanji, whatever. But those brush strokes denoted in those particles or radicals, I can't remember the word, uh, that to me is what I think of as detachable fragments that don't signify anything, but that are the elements of signification. I, and that's the closest I can conceive. That is the closest illustration or example I can even conceive of as that idea. And then my set follow up, and this is just to continue to complicate things, would that sort of non signifying element be what they mean when they, on the, in the very end of the reading, on page whatever, 83, 82, 80 something. Uh, oh, uh, 81, we're talking about schizoanalysis, you know, uh, it tries to overcome both the problem and the solution to deoedipalize the unconscious to reach real issues, right? Uh, this, um, this mission of schizoanalysis is to find the transcendental un unconscious, right? This transcendental thing. Would these elements, given that the transcendental is what makes the thing possible, the transcendental, like Kant would say, is the thing that makes the experience possible. It's not the thing, it's the thing that makes it possible. So are these little fragments the things that make it possible or is there something that makes those fragments possible so and, and, are, and it, first off is that an accurate or reasonable interpretation of non-signifying signs and then two is that an element of this transcendental unconscious they're trying to pick up on because i i don't get that i don't i don't understand what that necessarily means uh, and I'm also confused about what their definition of the unconscious is at all. I don't know what their, what their idea of the unconscious is, because for, for Lacan, it is the effect of language on a subject. That is the basic definition of the unconscious for Lacan, the effect of language on a subject. And the subject is the result of the movement of signifiers. So, okay, boom. And, and then, you know, this kind of, I can kind of see the problem. It, it explains it kind of quickly. It's like, kind of feels like it snaps right into place. And that is actually kind of, after reading, 
as much as I have, it's it's not as comforting as it may have been, you know, before. It's somewhat troubling, in fact. But so that's those are my questions, really. Is what is their idea of the unconscious? And are they not interested in unconscious, but transcendental unconscious? And is it made up of these non-signifying signs? And is my understanding of those non-signifying signs reasonable? That's my question. I have an answer uh, from page 53 uh, and with the last question about what is the unconscious for them. And I think on, on page 53, um, bottom of the first paragraph there, it seems like they're sort of, not entirely, but sort of equating the unconscious with the Lacanian idea of the real. And I don't understand how that works. And later on in the book, they also talk about how the imaginary and the symbolic, there is no split between those two. That's one thing. Um, and again, I don't understand how that works either. Um, and again, this is coming from a Lacanian standpoint. So I understand how Lacan works. I don't understand what they're saying. They say these things and then they don't elaborate. They start talking about something else, which I guess is, you know, okay, because it's schizo or whatever. Um, but it says on page 53, the unconscious itself is no more structural than personal. It does not symbolize any more than it imagines or represents. It engineers, it is machinic, neither imaginary nor symbolic. It is the real in itself, the quote, impossible real and its production. So, I mean, as far as I can tell, they're just sort of saying that you know, this entire like mapping of, of um, signification that Lacan does uh, in regard to the unconscious and, you know, the imaginary, the symbolic and the real, they're just saying that it's, I don't know, I, I don't understand what they're doing. It's frustrating to be honest. <laughs> but I don't know, Hunter, does that, do you remember that part? Yes, yes, yes. And I'm looking at it and I remember us. This is when I got into this big thing the other last seminar about like, why are they calling the analyst a mechanic, mechanic, an engineer? That's so weird. And then Chase was like, it's not like a little man, like working on like a little machine, like he's a machine and it, yeah, you know, oh my God. Uh, and so it's not about the position. Of the, I remember talking, I remember this being a point of intrigue for me or, or questioning. But I do, and I and now I'm looking at it. So and I and I can I can I guess if they like you said if the schizoid analysis dictates the, if if the caprice of the schizoid analysis dictates that we shall learn nothing else, you, we get nothing. That's all we get. Then yes, that would be very confusing. But if there's more to come, I guess in this description of the unconscious. Maybe, you know what I think, maybe, I mean, I think maybe the reason that it's so confusing to me that I'm like, it's like I'm trying to shove like a star-shaped peg through a triangular hole through my brain is like, I have a conception of the unconscious from, I mean, first from like pop culture, like the unconscious is like, you're the, you know, when you want to drive off the road and you have intrusive thoughts, like you want to throw a penny off of an Empire State Building or something, and you think, "Oh, don't do that," or whatever. Or unconscious, like, uh, "Oh, I uh, like when I'm I'm sleepwalking," or something. Like I'm trying to think of like pop culture ideas of the unconscious or the subconscious mind. Or when I say like um, uh, talking to my friend, and I'm saying like uh, something like. A Freudian slip. I have some Freudian slip. Like I accidentally say "fuck your mother" instead of like "how's your mother," and you know, or, "how's your how's fucking your mother" instead of "how's your fucking mother." You know, if I say something like that, it's like oh, "that's a Freudian slip." You're thinking, talking, thinking about fucking his mother. You know, oh my god, that's one thing. And then there's like the Freudian unconscious, which I've I was introduced to as this sort of lake of unthinkable content, as like a like an iceberg. And then Zizek came in and said, "No." It's the unreasonability of reason itself. It's a structural constitutive element of thought. It's not a, it's not a collection of, of data. It is a, <laughs> it is a obverse side to consciousness. <laughs> Good. Well, Deleuze would agree with that. Deleuze would agree with Zizek on that point. That, okay, okay. So that, that unconsciousness, the unconscious is not, well, okay. So, okay. So then I was just thinking maybe my understanding of like the unconscious is completely, 
you know, just so embedded in all these different interpretations that what they're doing is so radically different that I can't get it. But but okay, well, okay. If oh, that's what it, it, if that's what it means, I don't I don't understand what that means. I mean, Chase understand, but what what does it mean to say that it's the obverse side of consciousness? I don't I don't understand that. Well, so oh, so I was gonna go in order. I got three things listed here, but I'll I'll go with number two first. Oh, um, you can you can go with your order. Don't no. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm just it's not a, it's not a big deal. Um, okay, so I think I mean I don't know if this is exactly you know she's like concept or whatnot, but okay, one thing about the unconscious and the transcendental and how those are connected. So the transcendental is going to be distinguished from the empirical. So in Kant, this is the conditions of possibility for experience. Um, so the transcendental would be, okay, I've got these empirical givens, but formally, how are they possible? Uh, those formal structures, that's going to be the transcendental for Kant. Um, but for Deleuze, it's, it's not about logical possibility. Instead, it's going to be what uh, actually generates the empirical. So what actually actualizes the empirical? So this would be, these are, so he talks about genetic conditions and these are differential conditions also. So these are processes where you have something that is produced, uh, some kind of product, you know, and then you got, but you got production going on or you can see it in a kind of Spinoza's fashion as kind of, you know, nature, naturing, nature, natured, something like that too. Um, or the virtual that is actualized. Um, but don't, don't worry too much about those terms. But the big thing is that you're going to have, um, instead of this structure of logical possibility, the idea is that the empirical, it's generated by something that is different from it. So it cannot be given in this kind of uh, formal way in consciousness and say, oh, well, of course, it's just the same thing. Just we don't experience it, but that's what generates it. So it'd be something. So an example of what those are saying not to do um this kind of tracing from the empirical and then projecting that back into the transcendental into the differential genetic conditions that generated the empirical it would be something like okay i've got some kind of unified mind uh consciousness this is great actually it's awful um but anyways so how do I, how do I explain this? What are the, in order to, if I were to simply say, oh, well, it must be because there's some kind of consciousness that uh, unifies all of my experience into a consciousness. That would be this kind of, you say, no, that's taking what's already given and simply, uh, saying that that is the explanatory uh, device going on when really that's the thing that needs to be explained. Um, so that's that's kind of where they're uh, getting at in terms of the transcendental. So in terms of the unconscious, this would be, you know, what is not given also in consciousness, just like the transcendental. So if you kind of consciousness and the empirical are kind of on this manifest side of these actual, you know, molar objects, all this, you know, common sense, cool stuff. 
And then there's going to be these genetic differential conditions. That's going to be the transcendental, and that's also going to be the unconscious. Because what is so the unconscious? The big thing about it is it's productive. What does it produce? It produces well itself to some degree. Uh, Spinoza, um, but it also produces the empirical, it produces consciousness, produces all these other things too. So that's where he's basically taking the structure of a kind of transcendental conditions. And so in difference repetition, he says that's, it's also, that's the unconscious. The transcendental field uh, is also the transcendental unconscious. So I think another example that would help is so he uses the example uh, that he gets from Leibniz of these little perceptions. Um, and the example specifically is of the sound of the sea. So if you go, or the ocean, if you go down to the ocean, you know, fun times, go out on the beach, get sunburned badly, which I always do. Um, I hate being outside, I realized. I hate consciousness and I hate being outside. I just want to stay inside, just read Deleuze all day. But anyways, um, <laughs> so you're at, you're at the beach, you have fun, you know? I don't know, MTV spring break, you know, 2K23 or something. Um, and suddenly, uh, oh no, somebody, uh, instead of, you're drinking, but I don't know, somebody gives you some, somebody gives you a sweet tart and ends up, you've got uh, some LSD on there. And then before you know it, you're just kind of like hanging out just on the beach and you're just kind of laying back and you're listening to the sound of, you know, we don't, uh, we don't need the LSD. Just, we're just sitting at the beach. We're listening to the sea. We're listening to the ocean. Okay. The sound of the ocean, you can't hear any, you know, one particular wave necessarily. If you do, that obscures kind of uh, the distinctness of the whole sound of the ocean. It said the, the sound of the ocean is kind of given to you as one, uh, one clear thing, but it's, it's not able to give you some kind of uh, distinct individual parts in it. Those individual parts are always unconscious, uh, but they're kind of synthesized together to give you this uh, nebulous, singular sound of the sea as a sensation. Um, so the way that you have all these different waves of these individual, the sounds of these individual waves, that would be, but yet you always get one wave or one ocean as the sound. Uh, so this kind of synthesis would be something that that he would say, that's an example of the work of a passive synthesis. And a passive synthesis is just gonna mean an unconscious one. So I am not conscious of, you know, putting together, taking all these tiny waves, the sound of each wave and kind of like calculating them and putting them together to form, oh, okay, I got the sound of just the ocean now. Okay, it's all good. It said it just happens without any kind of conscious thought. It happens unconsciously. So that's gonna be an example of, there's some kind of unconscious synthesis going on. Um, so, but there's, there's obviously a difference there in the sense that, okay, the sounds, the individual sounds are not going to be the same as the sound of the ocean as a whole for me right there in my conscious experience. So that's going to be, I think, does that help at all that, that example? I still need to do your, the first question that, that Hunter brought up, but that's kind of do my 
second and third. I don't know, did that, people made them look confused, but I don't know. Any? Well, I mean, any, I, I'll any say back? this, I'll say this. Yeah, I don't, I now, okay. I, I, I really like the sound of the sea example. And I, I actually have, a, I have a, like a memory of me being on a beach. I took a bunch of Molly one time and I was on the beach, like trying to listen to music while I had this horrible ex-girlfriend that I was with. She wasn't my ex at the time, uh, but she was like telling me about something about how she was upset about something. And I was like trying to listen to music. And then I was like, <laughs> she and her presence had just turned the music into this like sour bitter resent filled thing and i could never i can never listen to the staves again there's a band from all from texas called the staves i could never listen to them again because i they are soured but what i can listen to is that when she i was like okay oh, i can't because she was upset that i was trying to put headphones in <laughs> and then she got mad and then walked away and then i took my headphones out because i didn't need them anymore and i just listened to the water and it was so peaceful and i and i i liked so i have a sense when I'm, that's just an anecdote but i'm saying i relate to this to the sense to that notion that you can't hear one particular wave because i i've done that i've watched a wave and tried to hear the sound of that wave falling you know what i mean and i kind of can for a second i can but not i mean what am i listening to it's a wave and the wave disappears as quickly as it exists um like it's you know the wave is it crashing waveness is the crashing of the wave um, <laughs> um but i'm saying i do now at least i have a sense of the like action of the unconscious like this um like you said this sort of passive synthesis this um i don't know if i would call it impenetrable but yeah like a sort of impenetrable because to act in a penetrative uh, mode towards it is to feel it crumble uh, the ocean and the sound the sound of the sea I like that because it's an alliteration I, I, don't, I prefer sound of the sea over sound of the ocean the sound of the sea <laughs> that is definitely better yeah. it just sounds it just rolls off the ah you know the <laughs> and I, I so the sound of the sea is a really cool illustration of this mechanism of unconscious passive synthesis and this realm of passive or unconscious synthesis i guess is really under analysis here by they lose then that this this aspect like you said this so that would be and it would be transcendental then the the mechanisms of synthesis that operate on this that that produce this passive synthesizing that's transcendental then right and he's mm -hmm. trying to uh, he's trying to figure out what that is and how that is structured i guess Correct. Yeah. yeah and then the other thing i asked about was just the the sign thing mm -hmm. yeah so your illustration with the uh the japanese script or whatnot i think that is a good example um so specifically what they're talking about with the these signifying series made up of these different elements that are non-signifying exactly that it, it that it would be one of those i think that could probably be doubted um but i but i think still your example is good in the sense that that is an example of something that is has components that are non-signifying that yet can be kind of put into something that on a this emergent level is capable of then of signifying something so especially if um so i think one example of this also would be something like so i, I found it actually more that Deleuze actually gets some of this from Lacan. Um, so in Logic of Sense, it's about how we come to form 
meaningful language, how language is possible, how sense is possible, how it is, how is it that I can, so I, I say possible, but he really he wants those genetic conditions. How uh, actually is sense really generated? Um, so, well, what is, the, what is different from sense? He's gonna say that's gonna be kind of when you're just enveloped within the body and these kind of primary drives and the these pure intensities of sound of the voice and your body that that is kind of the, what he calls a, the primary order and from there that's also what uh, he connects with the body without organs but don't pay any attention to that because the idea changes in this book so don't worry about it but the primary order that's going to be just kind of bodily noises that mean nothing so the question is how do i get from there in order to have these noises that i can make you know this vibrate wind out of my trachea or is that even the right anatomy? I have no idea. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> uh, so how is how does this happen? Um, I think there is kind of showing you. Okay, there's already a kind of a difference of levels there, in the sense that okay, I can say some kind of a vowel, and it itself is just a noise that it's just a physical noise. It's a vibration of air, it's their mechanical waves in the air. They say, ah, like that. So it has, it can go along and eventually kind of signify something. I'm signifying as an illustration, but in itself, that has no meaning. It's non-signifying in the same way, all these kind of noises of the body on one level are non-signifying, uh, but yet they can also be at the same time. They can go along and become some element of expression, some kind of content of signifying something. Uh, so I think something like that would be an example of what they're talking about in the sense of, yeah, there's definitely non-signifying things, but yet they can go into some kind of series that then actually signify something and the way that there's also this difference between those two um i think that kind of corresponds somewhat with the whole transcendental empirical or unconscious conscious that distinction of how yeah this the unconscious uh you know the individual sounds of all the individual waves, this nevertheless can give you this synthesis and consciousness of, I hear the sound of the sea. In the same way, I hear the sound of, of someone talking and it signifies something, even though on this uh, schizo level, the body of that organs, our toe, you've got just pure chaos and nonsense. Nonsense, not in the, the playful Lewis Carroll aspect, but nonsense and uh, this kind of impenetrable depth of the body. But that's logic of sense, so don't worry about that. Um, yeah. So, so then does the, does the, um, I'm wondering if, you know, when you go, so you've got the uh, connective synthesis and then the disjunctive synthesis and then the, what's the third one? The um, conjunctive. conjunctive. And so is, yeah. is it the transition from the disjunctive to the conjunctive where you begin to get, where you get um, sensible, uh, I don't know what to call them now, but things that actually have sense. Because, it, you know, the impression I got, you know, like he talked about the body without organs. 
having these disjunctive signs, these, you know, this disjunctive synthesis, these transversal lines of connection. Um, but are, you know, and then it sounded like last time we were saying that those signs on the bottom, those, those, those on the signs on the body without organs were non-signifying signs. And so is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the codes or whatnot that those recordings that are made on the body without organs those are going to be non-signifying in the sense that okay this is kind of like dna where you've got a genetic code where it corresponds with some way of uh this partitioning this distribution of what connects with what your your genetic code is going to help with that, but yet it itself does not signify anything. Especially if you think of, so I'm not sure exactly what, you know, Lacan or whatnot would say, you know, what exactly is signifying uh, or even really how they're using it exactly. But so in logic of sense, there's very specific definition of signification which is this idea that a proposition can simply uh, demarcate uh, um, universal concepts, more or less, universal or general concepts, so that I can say something like, let's go, let's go the platonic route, say love, you know, or the good. Actually, that, that one's bad. Love okay, this idea that can signify something as a kind of universal concept, more or less, uh, that action, that is what signification is. And I think from that, you can see that, yeah, your genetic code does not signify um, any kind of a concept. You know, this is... Uh, obviously much higher up the scale in terms of cognition and whatnot, where you, you suddenly get this complex language use. Uh, so I think that's, yeah, that seems to be, well, we've talked about this before, but you know, there's this, they want to de-emphasize the specifically the linguistic element and say that that's kind of isolated to just one aspect of it. And we shouldn't think of these other aspects so much in terms of linguistics, which was, you know, that was the whole structural rage with, uh, you know, Levi Strauss, who believed that he could um, look at a society's language, the structure of their language, the, the syntax, and would be able to figure out what their, the, um, their kinship relations would be. So whether they have something like cross cousin marriage or parallel cousin marriage, you'd be able to tell from the structure of their language. And you believe that, uh, yes, we can figure out these kind of fixed relations um, as these universal laws of these structures that are also kind of, they're unconscious in that you know, nobody's choosing to to construct the language this way or that. The same way I can't just like choose to suddenly like change English into something or, or not. Um, which that's also something that Lacan likes to get into is that, you know, it's not so much that the symbolic and the language is something just inside our heads, but we're actually inside of it. Um, so, the big thing, though, is that they want to instead emphasize that, no, this isn't the, it's not that um, all these signs and these codes, all this stuff is going on. It's not, it doesn't have this um, component of a linguistic system in a very strict sense. Uh, instead, that's going to be something that comes much later. And also, it has this kind of formal 
structure that they they want to have something much more open to variation. Uh, if you look at kind of what they actually say about linguistics and whatnot, um, that there can be something that they don't want these kind of universal fixed grammars like uh, Noam Chomsky talks about and whatnot. So that's where they're gonna try to get away from this linguistic structure of the unconscious while still saying, while still kind of agreeing with Lacan that the unconscious is structured like a language in the sense that it has these kind of components that are connected in these chains, but yet they're not chains where it's like a word and a concept kind of bouncing, you know, towards each other. Um, instead, of, I think it's something just more kind of uh, physical in a sense. <laughs> Okay, okay, last question, and I think we should call it. Um, would you say that, because Lacan does have a, a, a term, uh, which is used to refer to several things. I mean, la langue is uh, his term for actual language, as in like, you know how Plato in, I think it was Cratylus, was like, oh my God, it's such a shame that poor people are speaking our language because they ruin it with their stupid inability to speak properly and they've just diluted our perfect, we, we must have maybe once had a, I actually don't know, I don't know parole or parole, but I, I know la, 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 I know language versus la langue or like the, I'm, I'm looking here at some old notes of, uh, yeah, language versus la langue in the sense of uh, like the symbolic of language and the, um, but well, here's this other thing called a math theme. A math theme. I he's he he gets all into math in this part. I don't know anything about math. I don't want to do any math. I'm trying to be a philosophy student. But I I know that he, he okay okay. A good way to know la, la langue is the actual language. And there are two basic definitions. One is language as it's um spoken in reality and not theoretically, you know, in a dictionary or by the French Academy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My differential calculus, I really do need to study, actually. Hegel says so. Um, but I, the other way that people interpret la langua is baby babble. Is a baby going, boo-boo, poopy, oh my God, and I'm just making noises. Bah, 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 bah. Just uh, the noise, the burping and the grunting and the, uh, and the ooing and cooing of the baby, which is basically like, it appears to us as like the, the material basis from which symbolic differentiation kind of springs forth, like the soil from which the flower sprouts, basically the material basis uh, from which the realm of linguistic re reproduction or representation comes. Would you say that these, that um, the non-signifying sign is like La Long, that this, that this move away from linguistic structuring uh, is like a, denial of the primacy of language in favor of the primacy of a more like phoneme boo-boo babble material kind of um la langua thing like because i you know i don't i mean uh, maybe that would be going too far because they really are because that would be totally unstructured right that would be like that would be just chaos just just or, or like just pure pure chaos i think which I mean, it just seems too easy. It seems too, I don't, I don't know. It seems too, too reductionist. So like, I don't know, but what do you think? And then we can leave, we should leave. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, uh, I, I'm, I'm not totally sure really, but I would say that, yeah, that kind of, okay, especially this is very explicit in logic of sense that those says that is different from this kind of, um linguistic or so sense uh is going to be something that is going to be different from the kind of primary order of nonsense and of bodies that that's going to be which i think that would be the baby babble kind of thing um i think if it's kind of like you know just yeah, because it wouldn't be 
the second order of kind of like Lewis Carroll playful nonsense. But so I, I think, uh, so I think he's taking this from Lacan to a certain degree in the sense that, okay, this, Lacan says that you first have um, to enter the, the symbolic, it's, it has uh, this kind of separation from the body as the kind of primo materia. And that also, and that's what allows you to, to enter as a kind of speaking subject or whatnot. So Deleuze is saying something similar in the sense that we have to get out of this kind of depth of the body and enter some kind of, so uh, the surface of sense um, in order to be able to speak and all this stuff. So, and he even goes through and has this genesis of it through psychoanalysis, talking about Melanie Klein and partial objects and Lacan and castration, and even has an idea of the Oedipus complex. And he's for it. He's pro, he's seriously, logic of sense is crazy. It's like Deleuze arguing for castration and the Oedipus complex. Yeah. Although it's kind of, it's still, uh, he's problematizing at the same time, you know, but still it's, it's interesting. Um, I don't think I really answered your question, Hunter, but whatever, fuck it. What it's like nine. Seriously. So, yeah, yeah. Whatever. I think, well, I mean, but you basically answered my question, which is because the reason I ask is because I have this big book by Zizek where he says like la langua bullshit. It's the order of the superego. It's the injunction to enjoy. There's a connection between the id and authority and the, and, and the baby babble and every attempt at reconnecting with the material basis or whatever, that's just mimicry. And, blah, 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 and he's trying to really assert this primacy of the signifier of language, of la langua, boo, thumbs down. Language, based, very good. You know, like that's the thing to mm. analyze. But he's really trying to say like any attempt at focusing on la langua as the root is just a... It's, it's like an attempt at performing this sort of pre-symbolic mimicry of what we think pre-symbolic stuff is like. And we can only do it caught in this horrible after the fall symbolic realm. And so I was like, oh, well, if these non-signifying chains are like La Langua, then maybe I have a real in here to kind of be like, I see where Zizek separates and I can kind of go, <laughs> I've read about this before. But I, you did answer my question that in Sense and Nonsense, there is the clarification that these non-signifying signs are not this like, yeah, like you said, there's a difference between like Lewis Carroll nonsense and me going like there's there is a difference, you know, or like yeah, me burping yeah. or something, which I've done, mm -hmm. you know, plenty. <laughs> but I haven't. Yeah. So he uses, uh, yeah. he uses Arto as an example of this uh, as someone who. So. My thesis advisor, he said he looked at Arto's writings where he, he wrote some of this stuff down. Uh, so Arto, he he tried to translate Lewis Carroll and just like hated it. it was just like just he called it pig shit, um, whatever that is in French. Mirla, oh what is, whatever fuck it. Um, so and uh, so my professor he looked at this. Oh that's it. Yeah, con yeah. There you go. Wait, do you know? Do you look that up, Jackson? Do you know French? Uh, je connais français un peu. Actually, at the camp I'm in, yeah. we're going to stop the recording. Bye, everybody.